This show may contain explicit language and or spoilers. But think about it. How many times do you have a person who you come across in your life, somebody you work with, somebody you're in school with, somebody who, um, you know, is in or is married into or part of your family tangentially, um, where you go like, what the hell is this guy's motivation? Where is he coming from on this? And you, you, you question what the backstory is, how somebody could act or think or behave the way they do. And you're just kind of going, huh? You know, why? You know, it's just so unusual that you question where it's coming from. Welcome to the Greatest Movie of All Time podcast. I'm Tom Duncan. And I'm Dana Duncan. And tonight we bring you Cool Hand Luke, the 1967 film from Paul Newman. Uh, I think this might be the film he's probably pretty close to the most famous for. Um, Just off the top, um, basic plot summary. When petty criminal Luke Jackson, played by Paul Newman, is sentenced to two years in a Florida prison farm, He doesn't play by the rules of either the sadistic warden, played by Struther Martin, or the yard's resident heavy, Dragline, played by George Kennedy, who ends up admiring the new guy's unbreakable will. Luke's bravado, even in the face of repeated stints in the prison's dreaded solitary confinement cell, the box, make him a rebel hero to his fellow convicts and a thorn in the side of the prison officers. So, uh, basic risk or recognition, uh, nominated for Best Actor for Paul Newman, Adapted screenplay and original score. Uh, This movie did win for Best Supporting Actor in 67 for George Kennedy. It was a 2005 National Film Registry entrant. And in 2003, it was on the AFI's 100 Years, 100 Heroes and Villains list, which had Luke Jackson as the 30th greatest American hero in American cinema. Three years later, AFI's 100 Years, 100 Cheers, America's Most Inspiring Movies rated Cool Hand Luke number 71. So, as we do every week, what is this movie about? This movie is a movie that fits within the time frame of the late 1960s where it is about individualism and uh, standing against the norm and the flow of what is commonality. In this particular case, he's a rebel, and he is going to fight against everything that is traditional and um, regular, no matter what the cost. I can definitely see that as a through line. It, it is all part of this movie, and uh, it's what gives it its, I guess, essence. But to me, there's a, a undercurrent theme to the whole thing, and it seems like a, a more or less a forced nihilism um, said by the line, I mean, near the end of the movie, where you get most of the, I guess, character motivation that's finally played out. Everything up until that point is kind of um, by the seat of his pants, more or less, and you never really get... Uh, an insight into what makes Luke Jackson tick until it, it's in essence, um, they give the explanation of everything kind of in the last couple of scenes. And I'll point to one specifically. I've never planned anything in my life. It's this attitude, particularly because even though they don't explain a lot of him, um, they do some offhanded remarks as to uh, his character and why he's even ended up in this prison system. Um, but he's a war hero and you insinuate from that, that there are things that he's seen like most other people that have come through war and, um, are talked about in film, um, that give him this, this same sense of nothing in life matters. Um, I'm going to do everything that I want to do because I do it on a whim and based on the spur of the moment because nothing matters. All right. I understand your point. 
but I think this is more a movie about rebellion than it is anything else. Well, that's definitely there, but I think it's in the same sense. It's rebellion via this nihilistic point of view, uh, worldview of the attitude that he takes on um, as far as how he interacts with everything within the world, and therefore um, I'm going to rebel against everything because why not? You know, there's no consequence to anything because ultimately, take my life. You know, it doesn't matter. Okay. I, I think this movie could have been called F.U. just as much as it could have been Cool Hand Blue. Yeah, I, I so I read some of the um, contemporary um, reviews or just some basic highlights, and similar ones had it, it basically pegged as that. Uh, a similar um, anti-establishment film, even though this is kind of a weird setting for an anti-establishment movie. Yeah. But you also have such a charismatic figure like Paul Newman in order to do it that it pulls it off. I don't know how many other people um, that would be this charismatic in order to pull off this kind of thing, particularly given the very... Um, intense subject matter at times yes so i know we skipped over our normal piece of um you know what is our connection to this movie but this is the first time you and i have really even seen this movie you said you'd seen clips of it um Pieces. but right but not watch it from beginning to end and i only knew this and i'll, I'll say this much so i had a high school uh, spanish teacher who would often quote the most, what will likely be our best line um, candidate, but, um, and realistically from only that, and then mentioning that it came from this movie, I wouldn't have known anything else. And most people establish that this is like Paul Newman's best movie or whatever, the, the one that um, most people gravitate toward. Uh, outside of that, I really, I didn't have anything else coming into that. So this is like the second or third time where we've watched a movie I've never seen before for this. Um, there are plenty of... Th this cast has a lot of great people in it. Newman, um, you know, they're talking about Strother Martin as the, the warden or captain of the uh, piece. George Kennedy, who I really only know through the Naked Gun films, and the fact that he uh, ends up winning supporting actor for this, this yes. particular movie... Um, you get another young Dennis Hopper a couple of years before he does Easy, Easy Rider. Harry Dean Stanton, Ralph Wade, who went on to become the father in the Walton's TV series in the 70s. So, you know, this is no shortage of good actors and characters in this movie. Uh, all right. So with that, who was your best performer? Um... I really think the best performer was Paul Newman because he just had this knack for being mischievous without being obnoxious. So, okay, I again, and I go back to my statement a minute ago where I don't know how many people could have pulled off this movie and Paul Newman's one of them because he's, and they even mention it within the characterization of the movie. He's got that just winning smile that just easily breaks you as yes. far as, um, you know, your stone nature. I, I can't think of the, the right word to describe it, but unfortunately, I spent a lot of time watching this movie and we only watched it last night. But thinking, uh, I really don't understand what Paul Newman's doing in this movie. Because much like uh, his character, I don't think he knows what the character is. The character's all over the place. One minute he's sending um, this photo of him with two women. The next minute he's complaining because they're making a big deal out of the fact that he sent them the photograph. There are so many things where he's just like so up and down all over the place and it, it's again this sense of just nihilism of not caring of being against anything and going with 
absolutely whatever he's feeling in that particular moment that I'm like, there are much better Paul Newman movies. Like, honestly, The Hustler and The Sting, Butch Cassidy, yes. I think are all better than this movie. Yes. Well, so, is, or, um, what's the film um, that he did in the 80s where... The Verdict? He did The Verdict, but he did another one with... Uh, well, I don't know about that one. But... Yeah, there was another film he did that he, the film was nominated for Best Actor. It was a... Um, oh, I'm drawing an absolute blank. He played a, a, a handyman who was looking for work inside, so he stayed out of the cold with uh, Melanie Griffith in the part. I mean, there's a lot of films he's done that I thought were better films than this. Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, he was better. Well, that's one I haven't seen, so I can't really say that. But I, I think there are better uses of his skill that uh, ultimately there are some nice parts to this movie, but I, I don't really understand why everybody gravitates towards this. And so because of that, I thought the person I'm going to nominate for best performance um, constantly um, was the bigger presence through the whole thing. Uh, he seemed to be the the um, version of things where uh, I, I guess every scene he took over or was the bigger presence every time. He, Everything Paul Newman did was kind of understated unless he was doing something that was central to the action of the scene. And so I'm giving mine to George Kennedy. I think there's a reason he won supporting actor because I think by far he did the biggest uh, heavy lifting of this movie. All right. I can understand that. So who is your best minor performer? Um... That one was difficult for me because there were so many different um, character actors and such. And I can't even, I don't even remember the guy's name. One of the characters went on to, to uh, play the boss of um, McLeod on the McLeod TV series on the Thursday Mystery Night movie on NBC. So there's just tons of these people. But uh, I, I, Whenever Struther Martin was on screen, he just had a presence, and it's no wonder his line um, is one of the most memorable from the entire film. Well, it gets repeated at the end, and I think that's why it gives it an extra edge of significance. But So ultimately, uh, I'm going to... Uh, I had a very difficult time with this one as well. So I'll, I'll take your Strother Martin um, nomination there, but I went in a completely different route. So we've had this category as best minor performance. So I felt that it had to go to a minor performer. But most of this movie, especially the second half of the movie, is really George Kennedy and Paul Newman. And they're the only major presences. Everybody else is kind of background. Uh, even to a certain extent, because like I couldn't even recognize which of the guards or bosses or uh, whatever they called them um, was the one making him div dig the grave, then fill it back in, then dig it out, and, and et cetera, and et cetera. So other than Strother Martin, who came in kind of there, and I thought about giving it to him, but I thought some of his role was a little blunted even. Um I struggled a while to try and figure out which one because normally I would give it to Paul Newman, but he's not a minor performance. Okay. So by that token, I went in a different direction to recognize somebody else that probably wouldn't otherwise. Conrad Hall, the cinematographer. All right. You think of how many different, and I think I said it four or five times. Oh, this is an interesting shot or, oh, this is kind of cool uh, of an angle or, but then okay. the tone and the presence that he gives the movie by all of the, like, it's one of those movies that you get a definite heat index yeah. attached to it. There are several of these summer-like movies where you um, just, you can see the heat radiating off of everybody involved and the background and the setting and everything else. 
And I think from just that standpoint alone, for all of the work that was done in order to put the shots together, I think he could easily be recognized for what he was done. Because I think there are too many uh, flaws from a writing standpoint. I didn't think the music was great. Um, and I think the direction leaves a bit to be desired. So if you're not going to nominate Paul Newman, it was the one place where I felt comfortable enough giving somebody some recognition. Okay. Actually, this is one of these films where having watched it, I think the myth is greater than the reality. That happens with a lot of the movies we've seen, uh, to be quite honest. Like, there, there's a certain attachment, and then you're looking at things in a much different light by the time you actually watch them, or that you, when you and I have done it for this podcast where we're looking at it from a much more academic perspective, we kind of look at things very differently. Um, most charismatic award. Do we even need to go over this one? I mean, it's Paul no. Newman. Yeah. I mean, we we've mentioned it multiple times. Um, he, the award winning smile, the charisma. He, it's just it, well, it. Do we know the name of the guard that had the weird sunglasses? I don't think so. I didn't really look it up because, again, this was one where I thought there were like three different guards with mirrored sunglasses. No, there's one guard with mirrored sunglasses, and that's. That, you know, other than Paul Newman, that's the only other one that I would say is charismatic. I don't know. I just, okay. So best scene. I have a few different nominations. Uh, Lucille. Yes. That was or the car scene. wash. Uh, given that that one has kind of been reused a little bit, um, notably in the Sandlot uh, from the early 90s, uh, I thought that was worth including. The boxing match, because I yes. think that's where he starts to win everybody over. Everything's kind of understated till that point, but it kind of um, gives you a background to the rest of the movie and how it kind of plays out, that he's just going to continue to take all these punches and keep getting up until yes. he can't anymore. Um, cool Hand Luke, where he gets his name uh, when they're playing poker. Yes. Um, basically just bluffing the whole time. Yes. Uh, 50 eggs. That, yes. Okay. Uh, outsmarting the dogs. Yeah. Uh, the second escape. All right. Breaking Luke. Okay. So the um, grave digging scene. Yeah. The third escape where he has them all snowed and then takes off in the truck. Yes. And then the final... Uh, sequence which I titled Failure to Communicate. Okay. Out of those, what would you say is the best scene? The last scene, uh, Failure to Communicate, because it really disclosed as much about what the film was and what his character was as of, as of any. If there's any one particular scene where Paul Newman had to like do a, a really great job of acting, I think it's in that scene. The only other one where you could say that he's doing something like breaking Luke is kind of in the same essence because I think those two kind of run together. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'll buy that. So out of those, what would be your favorite scene then? My favorite scene is actually the uh, uh, 50 eggs. I think it's mine too, and it's also my indelible moment. Because, and I, I did it for one thing. I started looking up last night while we were um, watching the movie, uh, what's the record for most eggs? Because I'm like, I think somebody could legitimately eat 50 eggs in a short period of time with how many competitive eaters we have. Now, I want to set the record straight, at least from Google, I was able to find somebody ate 65 hard-boiled eggs in 6 minutes and 40 seconds, uh, and they ran out of eggs or she could have done more. So that was 2003. But, um, I don't know. I behind don't know. that, in the, in the Google suggestions, it did have, did Paul Newman really eat all of those eggs? And apparently, uh, according to people on set, he only ate about 8 because every time they'd cut, he would go throw up in a trash bag. <laughs> yeah, so, 
Did you have a different indelible moment? No, I think that's that's probably it. Although I would have to say a close second would be the boxing match because I've been there. I've been in those situations where you just keep slugging because you're just not going to let them tell you you can't. I mean, that scene to me was the epitome of a lot of my life. I think that has a lot of um, broader universal themes to it. So, all right. Um, can we basically just skip ahead on best line? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's doubt. Well, and this is the thing. It's repeated twice. So we'll give it if credence. It's different. It, it is different. The first one is, is what we have here is failure to communicate, and that's Struther Martin, and then repeated by Luke at the end, spoiler, and then he shot through the throat. Yes. So I gave it to the Luke version of it because it's the one most often cited by um, people doing this. But for the sake of argument, I didn't think until I started putting this together how many great lines there actually are to this movie. So um, the the last thing as um, the movie's kind of fading out, so Dragline or uh, George Kennedy's character, he was smiling. That's right. You know that. That Luke smile of his, he had it on his face right to the very end. Hell, if they didn't know it for, they could tell then that they were going to beat him. That old Luke smile. Oh, Luke, he was some boy. Cool hand Luke. Yeah, hell, he's a natural born world shaker. There are so many summation lines, and that, that's kind of one of them. As a, it, it was a good ending line, but I thought, you know, all right, we'll throw that one in here. Um, drag line again. My lord, whatever I've done, don't strike me blind for another couple minutes. Yes. Um, again, referencing the Lucille scene. So captain or road prison um, 30, or the, I guess the warden, if you will. You run one time, you got yourself a set of chains. You run twice, you got yourself two sets. You ain't going to need no third set because you're going to get your hit, your mind right. I know this is kind of la lacking context, but um, I think that's right after they catch him the first time, if I remember correctly. So, um, so the next piece, and I thought it was something in inclusion because most of the time I'm going back and piecing together the best lines after the fact. Um, yes. This is one where I remarked in the moment that I thought this was something worth something. And I think it has broader application beyond this. And that's why I thought it was as good as it was. So context for this particular one, um, Luke has found out his mother's dead. They're going to put him in the hot box to try and prevent him from escaping to go to her funeral. Boss Paul, sorry, Luke, I'm just doing my job. You got to appreciate that. Luke, nah, calling it your job. Just don't make it right, boss. Yes. I think there are way too many people, you know, you start thinking about, and we might give it away, but people who object privately behind the scenes of the Trump administration to saying, I don't like what's going on, but uh, somebody's got to do the job, so I might as well. No. You know, the amount of times that people have objected and said, well, I was only a part of things because that was what was expected of me. I was just doing my job. Jobs are voluntary. Yes. You have to put in a certain amount of um, acquiescence, at even a minimal amount, in order to do or accomplish what they're telling you to do. And thus, uh, just simply doing that as an excuse is a pretty bad one. Yes. I think, honestly, this line could have very easily been applied to um, another movie we'll eventually cover, Judgment at Nuremberg. It's in Judgment at Nuremberg. I don't remember it being in that. Not there. quite the same, but it's the basic thing. Well, and that's why I'm saying it has a broader application. Yes. The, uh, the um, Burt Lancaster character several times makes lines that are very similar. All right. Um, 
so this is the cool hand Luke scene. Um, after he's uh, um, beaten uh, Dragline and the other character, I think it was um, Coco, but uh, on the poker hand, nothing. A handful of nothing. You stupid mullet head. He beat you with nothing. Just like today when he kept coming back at me with nothing. Yeah, well, sometimes nothing can be a real cool hand. Yes. And again, this is a form of his nihilism where why not gamble with everything because I don't care if I lose. There's really nothing to lose anyway because nothing matters. Um, I already mentioned this one, but I never planned anything in my life. That comes during kind of that ending sequence where, um, you know, dra drag lines questioning him about, you know, they didn't break you. You just set them up and all that. No, they did break me. Uh, I never had a plan to run. I've never planned anything before. So that's really a, a line that's very difficult for me to understand because I plan my free time. Yeah. You you plan just about every second of every day. You uh, going on family vacations with you and mom, where we had an itinerary, is mm -hmm, um, distressing. Anyway, uh, Coco and Luke. Coco, God, she don't know what she's doing. Oh boy, she knows exactly what she's doing. She's driving us crazy and loving every minute of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's a weird scene of, um, I think as we get broader and a bigger appreciation on like, um, I don't, I don't want to say promiscuity, but like, and I don't want to say sexual freedom either, but like an advanced knowledge of people's, um, kinks, if you will, that exhibitionism is a little bit more understood. And that's exactly what this, this whole thing was. And I think there that actually does age well as a scene so uh and then finally dragline and luke why do you gotta go and say 50 eggs for why not 35 or 39 i thought it was a nice round number so uh which of those would you i guess since we've already basically established the best line because it's the one that's most quotable yeah. it's been the most brought up um repeatedly um which one of those would you put as maybe the honorable mention and funniest lines? I like the one you had to go and pick 50 eggs, you know, that whole thing. Because that, that is I think that's my nominee one. for uh funniest line. Yeah. But I think the the one we we talked about the most with doing your job. I'm going to give that as the honorable mention, though. I, I just right. think there, that it, because of its broad application and everything else that we've been doing, um, that makes the most sense to me as far as uh, where to go with that. So um, to recap just briefly, as you could probably have guessed, what we have here is a failure to communicate is our best line. Honorable mention, um, just calling your, your job, don't make it right, boss. And uh, uh, why'd you say 50 eggs being our uh, three nominees for this evening? So uh, let's dig into the grading. So legacy. Uh, I had down a six and a half. Now, again, I think this is a... You mentioned it before, somewhat mythologized film that yes. it has a certain status. But you don't see it on a ton of, like, it'll creep in here or there, but you don't see it on, like, best films lists a ton. No. Um, you see it occasionally, you see the character, but I think this movie has a lot of flaws, and I think people have kind of seen that. And ultimately, certain other Paul Newman movies or, or whatever else, I think, um, grayed out a little bit better. So, I gave it a six and a half. What did you have down? I had a six. Okay. So that puts it at 6.25. Um, why did you put it as a 6? Because of the simple fact that um, I think that this film has a certain rebel element 
to it that was within the, the same parameters of a lot of films in the late 60s, but it really has kind of slipped through the cracks. It doesn't have the same staying force that a lot of films have. So it's better than halfway, but it's not more that much more than halfway. Yeah, and that's kind of where I ultimately fell on this one. I think because it's had such pop cultural relevance for a few decades, but that it's kind of faded out um, is kind of where I'm at. And so maybe we're just a few degrees or a gradient here or there uh, different. But so that'll establish it as a 625 for our uh, legacy. What did you have for impact significance? Other than the one line, I had a five. So, all right, give your reasoning behind that, but I, I, you and I are a little bit different on this one. Well, because, again, this is a film that's kind of faded into the background. It is not, you know... It, you and you're forgetting the category, because the impact significance is within that five-year window in the moment. But it, even then, this is one of multiple anti-establishment films that were coming out in that 1967, 68, 69 era. You can look, there, it's one of about a dozen films that were like this. But not that are highly quoted that end up having like tail end where you have uh, yes, some level of it. there is. Because you can look at all the different anti-establishment movies. The Graduate. You can look at um, uh, um, uh, Oh, why am I drawing a blank? Sidney Poitier, um, Heat of the Night. I mean, these are all films that were that were against the normal trend of society, of where things were. They were kind of in your face. This, we're not going to accept what the cultural norm is. And there are do a dozen of these films that went through that time frame that just basically said, we are... We are challenging the status quo, and you can quote from each one of those. So this came out in 67. It ended up grossing about $16.5 million. Um, to me, that is significant bank for that time. So I think in the moment, I gave it a 7. I, I just don't see the argument for a 5. I really don't. I think this is one that did stick out. I think this is a character that uh, a lot of people enjoyed. Um, I think there's a reason it, it achieved some level of mythical status among people that are either your peers or pe people that are just slightly older than you that give it a certain elevated status. I think it's faded out because it only resonated with that generation. And as those have gotten either older or whatever else, it hasn't stuck with uh, more modern audiences in the same way. But I, in the moment, I think it's much more deserving than, than the five. No, I disagree. I think this film is one that even during that time frame paled against the more biting uh, criticisms of society than that. All right. Well, that averages it down to a six, though. So uh, novelty. Uh, I had an eight. I think you're going to heavily disagree. I do think that there are some... Um, Particularly because uh, all the films that you mentioned were a couple of a year or two after this, and I do think that there were a couple of films before it that you could say are counterculture uh, to a certain extent. But uh, ultimately, I do think that you know you're exploring the prison system, you're exploring um, police and like prison brutality, um, you're exploring these um, rebellious or nihilistic tendencies. Uh, some of these are not, and particularly the level of intensity that they have. Yes, they do um, put in some rather um, lighthearted sequences. The eggs thing, even the boxing match, I wouldn't say is necessarily um, like serious or intense. But as the movie goes along, it's really dealing with some much broader themes. And then that ending sequence where he dies. Uh, ultimately, I think you're getting to something that's a little bit more uh, broad or serious than um, otherwise. So I gave it an eight on the novelty. I gave it a 
seven. I thought about 6.5, but I gave it a seven. And it's primarily because of the setting of a inmate as the hero. Um, yeah, okay, that's a good that's a great point that I didn't even consider in you know going above your score. Because originally this is one of these films, and you can go back the dirty dozen, which we've done. Yeah. Kelly's Heroes. Um, you know, there's a whole list of these and or counterculture movies that were starting to come out. This is not the first. No. It was in the middle of the pack. And it was, you know, a certain easy writer was what year? Was this I think it's 69. I'd have to look it up to be sure. But there's a whole group of these. And I don't consider this to be cutting edge, but the fact of the prisoner as a hero, you have to understand that, that this is also about the time that Johnny Cash struck gold as being the country music artist who was the man from Folsom Prison. Um, Folsom. Folsom okay. Prison. And, um, you know, and it's all that, that, that thought process is that prisoner is a subject of his environment and therefore has to be given some level of a pass or as his behavior because of where his circumstances has placed him. So that average is out to a seven and a half. Um, all right, classicness. There are some things that age really well and that are a bit ahead of their time. Um, the, if you want to say um, to a certain extent that um, Luke is an anti-hero i could buy it although i don't think there's anything in particular that he does i mean the, the fact that his only major crime in order to get on this chain gang in the first place is basically twisting the heads off of meters in yes. whatever town he's in and first off that's a civil forfeiture why the hell is he in prison um that that doesn't even make sense from uh, as far as that goes i could have thrown that i didn't throw it in remaining questions this the movie actually caused me to have quite a few um, remaining questions, but yeah, um, the and I mentioned this to you, like the fact that the prison was all white guys, yes. and your your comment was, and it makes sense, but like you know, there are you're not going to throw white and black guys together even in prison in Florida. Correct. I just that that doesn't make sense to me because like you're dehumanizing them anyway. What's the matter? Oh no, that that's part of the whole rationale. I mean, because no matter what, this is part of the whole southern um, racial racial culture, which is you know you might be a sharecropper in the lowest form of humanity for a white person but you're still better than the black person. And that's the culture. To some extent, that's, that's what the perpetuation of racism that goes out of this country, which is you might be um, illiterate, you might be uh, jobless, but you know if you can get told you're better than somebody because of race, now you're going to believe that because that's how you develop your value. And that's how it is applied. What and, you're describing is a natural caste system. Correct, which is what has been in existence, especially in the South, since the antebellum period. And you mean 1619? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I don't mean to be flippant, so I, I should just say that for the general audience. I know I giggled, but yeah. Yeah. The point being is, is no, because even the, the white prisoners are going to be treated better because they're at least not being mixed with black in Florida. Because everybody, and I mean, I'm the first person to think this. Because you think of Florida as more metropolitan now because of the uh, influx of uh, resettlements from the Northeast, especially in New York down there, and the influx of 
Cuban immigrants and all the rest of this from the from the uh, Caribbean. So you think of it as more a northern oasis in the south. Florida was much more backwatered and southern than most of the other states around it. I mean, it was. It was not good. I mean, this blew well, up even to the okay. Not so the northern Florida and the Florida Panhandle still has a lot of these elements to it. So yes. I don't want to say that like they've graduated above this. No. Um, I, I know that might be a gross characterization, and it probably is, and somewhat unfair. But you know, there's a reason why people joke about Florida the way they do. Yes. So. Um, as far as the classic, I don't remember if I gave my score. I've kind of, in talking about it now, I've graded it up slightly to a 7. But where do you come in? I actually had 7.25. I was going back and forth between 7 and 7.5. And but I, I'll split it and go with 7.25. Well, I don't need you to split it. I mean, that's going to make it <laughs> the grading right, them. 7.5. Because then I get to have my 7.25. Exactly. All right. So um, final category, rewatchability. To me, I, I you know, I, there are parts of this I enjoyed. I could watch it over. It would be an interesting film study. Uh, but we've already said, I, I don't think this is Paul Newman's best movie. There are other Paul Newman movies that I'd rather watch. I know that you, this is definitely not yours. Um, I thought it was middle of the road, but maybe just slightly above that. So I went 5.5. I went 4. Because this is a film that if um, the Grand Wizard of Oz came and said, I hereby decree that you shall never watch Cool Hand Luke again, my reaction will be, okay. Okay, so uh, that that's that's quite the statement, but uh, so that puts it at a four point seven five. Um, audience score was a ninety five actually, so that puts it at nine point five uh, four points. So altogether, that puts it at a thirty uh, six point five and. Uh, just in between uh, Inglorious Bastards and Zodiac for number 28 on our list. Okay. I would like to tell my Paul Newman anecdote as long as we're doing a Paul Newman film. Sure. All right. Well, I have, or, um, my wife and I, or my wife was a coordinator for a student exchange program. So we made friends with a lot of, um, a lot of uh, other coordinators uh, for student exchange through the year. By the way, one of my close friends through this program passed away yesterday so, uh, from brain cancer. So I'll just mention his name so that there's some level of memorial to him, even though most just, people wouldn't, but yeah. Bob Puckett. But anyway, but another friend of ours um, happened to be a, a, a software salesman. And he happened to be in a hotel in Ohio, and he's sitting at a bar, and uh, this is not Bob Puckett. I do no, want to make that distinction. Correct. Different friend, um, and he tells this story. He says he's sitting at the bar, and he orders a beer, and he look, or and he look, and a guy down at the other end of the bar, and it's just the two of them in the bar. He orders a beer, and he looks up, and then he looks down the bar, and he realizes who this is. And he tells the bartender, um, I'd like to pay for that beer. And the guy says, no, 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 no. You don't have to buy me a beer. And he says, no, no, no. I would love to. And he says, all right, I'll tell you what. I'll let you buy me the beer. I'm kind of alone. So why don't you can come down. But the ground rules are we can't talk about anything but fishing. It was Paul Newman. I think you told this on the Sting podcast. Did I mention this? I think you did, but you know, All right. it's fine. Anyway, the whole point is is that he spent the entire like an hour talking about fishing because 
He was there for a high school class reunion. Apparently he was from Ohio originally. And uh, he was there to see friends and people that he knew growing, growing up. And it was like, I don't know, some, you know, he's got to be in his 70s at this point in time. Because I think he died when he was 80 or 82. So, um, and uh, um, they sat and talked for about an hour about fishing. He didn't talk about acting. He didn't talk about a movie. Didn't talk about anything other than fishing and where to go fishing in Ohio. And that's all they talked about. And he said it was a great time. And he said he was an extremely nice guy, but he really was very private. He didn't want to talk about his private life. And he didn't want to talk about his career. He wanted to talk about activities that he enjoyed separate from his public life. All right, so remaining questions. We'll get to the last portion of the uh, episode for today. This has actually been quite a short episode by comparison to some of the other ones we've done, but um, what did Luke do in the war that he was awarded for? In almost every description of this movie, they talk about him being a war hero um, early on, but they is that just mean like he's the average war hero where you know he comes back and therefore we can... Um, you know, treat him as such, or did he do something actually heroic? Was he awarded something? Yes, they mentioned. I missed it then. He was in the Navy. He was awarded a, uh, a bronze star and a silver star, which means he was, and uh, two purple hearts. So he was wounded in combat and uh, exemplified heroic um, uh, activity under fire. Interesting. Okay, so that, that does make a little bit more sense, that he clearly was in the heat of something. Um, but it, they don't give a whole lot of backstory to that, so I was very confused uh, over that whole element of his character, that that was like the only thing they gave us is his background. Yeah, I don't remember who said it offhand, but the, the comment has been that a hero is nothing more than somebody who's cold enough and tired enough to not give a shit. Boy, is that like cynical. That's a comment or a quote. And I can't remember who said it. Um, but, you know, and in some extent, that's exactly his character. His character comes across as being somebody who acted not because of any level of hero heroism. It's just that he was in a position where he just didn't give a shit, so he just acted. I, I mean, it would have been interesting, and maybe the, the screenplay could have developed. I mean, this was based on a novel. I'd be curious to see what the novel says, if the novel does more in-depth character study than this. But, you know, that would have delved into a lot and really furthered the movie to develop and explain that aspect if it's in the book. Um, you know, what he did in the war that allowed him, because I think if his, his heroism was nothing more than he was just put in a position where he just didn't give a shit about his life. And so he acted because that's just the option he had. I think it would go a long way to explain his behavior within the prison. Uh, I, I could... I definitely buy that. Um, it, there's definitely a lot of baggage he's bringing in um, to make this movie, uh, or not this movie, but like drive the story. And I, I think that's the place where I seemingly was more lost than ever before because he's doing something rather um, childish to a certain extent to even get there in the first place. Um, you know, it, you could see that being like a high school prank or something else where people are just being. But think about it. How many times do you have a person who you come across in your life, somebody you work with, somebody you're in school with, somebody who, um, you know, is in or is married into or part of your family tangentially, um, where you go like, what the hell is this guy's motivation? Where is he coming from on this? And you, you, you question what the backstory is, how somebody could act or think or behave the way they do. And you're just kind of going, 
huh? You know, why? You know, it's just so unusual that you question where it's coming from. Next question I had, why is he even trying to escape? Like, they hold him in uh, the box um, to, and he misses his mother's funeral. They make a point of saying, you've missed your mother's funeral. And it didn't seem like he really cared all that much, even the one scene that's kind of thrown in there. Um, like, he does, but he doesn't. Um, like, he's he's got some manner of um, heartache when his mother passes, because they have that... Uh, scene where he ends up playing the banjo and doing all of this other stuff, but um, I, I, since he missed the funeral, what's the point? Other than by the time he gets out of the box, because they put him in there in the first place, is it just simply um, a, a matter of fuck you? That's exactly it, because that's what the whole thing is about. It's a matter of if they would have done nothing except say, we're sorry your mother died and then just didn't do anything, I don't think he tries to escape. The fact that they made a big deal of it and put him in the box because, you know, we're going to prevent you from doing it only may heighten the desire to, sh to just one up them. I, I wonder if it's in the same vein then that. Um the rather indicative boxing fight. You know, George Kennedy ends up picking the fight more with uh, Luke than Luke does with other things, where he's just telling him to be quiet um, because he's talking too much, and so then they pick the fight. But as long as he's going to throw punches at him, he's going to get up and, and stand right in his face and try and throw a few punches back. Yes. It's all about, I'm only going to retaliate to the level of your ex effort. The more effort you put into telling me what to do or how to do it, the more I'm going to say, I'm going to fight you every step of the way. You reduce the um, level of uh, conflict and my desire to respond less. All right, the last one that I have, because uh, I'll eliminate one of them. Um, I, I just, I, it's not as good a question, but uh, why did he send the photo if he was just going to be annoyed by it? He wasn't expecting to come back. Okay, but why send the photo in the first place? Because it's funny. That's all about him. He's trying to show a one-up. He's trying to be flippant. This is what happens. I escape. Here I am. I'm living the good up you. I'm, I'm not only thumbing my nose at the prison, I'm thumbing my nose at the other inmate. All right. I acted, you didn't. This shows even yet again that I'm better than you because of the way I choose to live. I wish we could talk longer, but I'm expecting a friend for dinner uh, next week. Uh, I'm not sure. But we've been kind of Doing this by the seat of our pants, I'm hoping that we may or may not have a guest here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we have some back episodes that we could fill in, so uh, stick around on this feed for that one. Um, we did uh, create a new email for the show this week, um, greatest uh, all time movie podcast dot, or at gmail.com. Again, that's greatest all time movie podcast all one word at gmail.com if you want to email the show and get in contact again you can follow in the show link uh, or the show notes the link for the uh, specific outline for this episode and you can see our general list of uh, all 31 films that we've done up to this point um, we are looking forward to uh, finishing the last uh, 19 for this season or being our first year uh, and we're going to be coming to you if you have any suggestions of one you'd like to do or uh, if uh, you would be interested in potentially being a guest on the show, please email the um, uh, email that I uh, just read out. Again, greatest all time movie podcast dot com or at gmail dot com. Gosh, I, I need to get better at reading that particular uh, piece there. But um, the greatest movie of all time is a production of Ronnie Duncan Studios. Our show is mixed, edited, and written by Thomas Duncan. Our music is thanks to Purple Planet Music. 
Thanks, everybody, and have a great rest of your week.